Well, good evening. Good to be back with everybody. We're almost there. Two classes left tonight and Wednesday, so we have almost made it the duration, so thank you for your patience. A couple items of housekeeping as we sometimes do at the beginning. First of all, last time we were together, I showed you this slide of this young, handsome devil in this football uniform. And while nobody wanted to speak up where we could all hear, I have been told by a couple of individuals, and to their credit they did tell me, that when I said the phrase, full of energy and vitality, they in turn uttered full of hair. And I would just let you know that if that was you, that was good and appreciated joke, but you're also making light of something that I can't control. So I hope you feel good about yourself. <laughs> there is nothing I can do about that. This is not by choice. If I let it just grow, it's more of the bozo effect. Thick on the sides and shiny on the top. Yes. Yeah, buddy, I'm trying desperately to make up for it here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Accepting it gracefully. We're giving it a shot anyway. But, so that was last time. I'm not going to show you any more pictures of myself tonight, current or otherwise. My skin is just too thin for that, I guess. But as I said, we're inching very, very close to the end of our time together. And so it's dawned on me, possibly by the loving words of my wife, that while we've been in this class, this study beyond the hevel, this study in Ecclesiastes, trying to shift our perspective of how we view this life and this life under the sun, that while we've mentioned hevel throughout the class, and in the beginning we kind of talked about what it is, we haven't really revisited exactly what hevel means or why the class is titled that since early, early on. So in case you weren't in here early, early on, I want to give a very brief recap of that. If you will look at the first page of Ecclesiastes with me, the first words of the actual preacher here in verse 2, it says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then flip just a few pages over to the last page of Ecclesiastes in verse 8, which is, if you were in the beginning of the class we think that, or at least I'm under the impression, that's where the words of the preacher stop, and then we get a conclusion from the author. But the last words we have recorded again are vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. And the word vanity here, this translation comes from the word hevel. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, if you are a language nerd, I apologize. I am butchering the pronunciation of that word, I'm sure, and I will continue to do so. But in short... There's multiple meanings in our modern English language that this word can take on, right? So it can mean literally like a smoke or vapor or fog, something that is there and then pretty much instantaneously gone. And then it can mean something that is trivial or meaningless. And thirdly, I think we see it used to mean something that is hard to understand, something that is an enigma, something that may be paradoxical to us. So when we refer to Hevel throughout our class, and when we look at this study beyond the Hevel, those are the things that we are trying to highlight and the things that the preacher would have us to see. So I just wanted to revisit that because I know that I had not done a good job of maybe the fuller explanation of that throughout the quarter. When we were together last time, we started looking at chapter 11, starting in verse 7, through chapter 12, verse Eight. And we mentioned that there are two things that we really want to draw out of this portion of text. One of those being to rejoice now, to be filled with joy, to be filled with pleasure in the life that we have because judgment is coming. And that's where we spent the majority of our time together on Wednesday. And the second one being to calmly remember that life is in fact for the living. And that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight. We did a brief introduction, or maybe not as brief as it should have been, but we mentioned that there were two options here. One is to be shrouded or enveloped or covered by the fact that we have our death coming and living sort of in fear of that, not allowing ourselves to enjoy the world around us because we are in fact shrouded by our death. And the other option is to be shaped, 
to be shaped by the knowledge of our coming death and to let that guide our decisions and actions in this life to live as God would have us to live. And we talked about how society fights against that many different ways. We went into that on how they try to at least avoid or at least ignore, if not avoid, the fact that we are all mortal and all are going to go through the aging process. And then the fact that the problem with that, then, is it presents a worldview that looks to do just that, rather than to gracefully accept and use that process the way that God would have us to use it. And so we started talking about rejoice now, this living a life of pleasure, living a life of joy while we are here under the sun. And we mentioned that this is really the last hurrah before we get to the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes, this last piece of text before we get to the conclusion that is once again highlighting the three main things that we've been talking about, that life is a gift from God, not gain of our own pursuits, life is beyond our control, and that we should live with the end in sight so it can shape the way that we go about our days. And with the warnings and admonitions to the youth in the text, we mentioned that it's at times a relative term, that in the text, when we're speaking about youth, while at times it is pointing directly to someone that is of a young age, that it's possible, and I think that it is more than likely the case, that at times youth here is referring to someone, whether they're 16 or 66, that still has certain abilities about them, the ability to do the things that the preacher is asking us to do. And we looked at the imagery of creation through the text, and then how sometimes the youth is wasteful of the bounty that God has given us because they only know what it is to be young, that they have not experienced some of the aging process that we're going to see more fully tonight discussed here by the preacher. And then we mentioned, again with the creation imagery, this revisiting of Eden, that when we do these things, when we're wasting our youth, when we are not accepting what God has given us, the bounty that God gave us as being full and complete, like Adam and Eve, we are insinuating that God, a God whom we call good, a God who we love and say that he gives all good things and is almighty, we are insinuating that he is withholding something from us. And that surely should not be the case. And so that got us to this last point. We didn't quite go through it, so that's where we're going to begin tonight. And that's looking for joy. In the light of all that other information, the fact that we should be looking for joy in this earth, on this earth and how we should do that. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we will continue down that path. Father, thank you so much for the great day that you've given us, the opportunity that we've had to come together today to worship you and then come back together tonight to study your word. We thank you for all the things that you provide us, the care that you give us, and the love that you have for us. We ask that you please be with those of our number who need your comfort and your healing and give them that completely. Father, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So the last item here under this idea of rejoicing now is, as you can see, looking for joy. We can look at the world around us that God has given us. And we can look at that world with a sense of wonder, a sense of delight, a sense of gratitude, a sense of pleasure, and we can be thankful while we realize the good things that he's given us. On the other hand, we can look at the world around us, and much like we talked about feeling that maybe we haven't been given all that we should be given, we can feel that we're slighted, we can feel that we have not been giving, given every opportunity that we should be, and we can have a grumpy, cantankerous demeanor towards the people that we've been, have put in our lives or just our lives in general. But one day, that view that we take of the world, as we see here in the text, is going to be called into account. It's not going to be me calling in Clay's view of his life. 
It's not going to be clay calling in my view of this life. But as we all know, and as the text highlights, it's going to be God calling into account the way that we viewed the world and the time that we had in it. Not simply whether we did the right or the wrong thing, but as being suggested here to us, something much deeper than that as well. The way that we beheld and cherished the world that God has given us to live in. So if we're going to be called into account for that, and we're not doing that properly as of now, we must take whatever steps are necessary to change it. Because when the account is being given, clearly it's going to be too late. So in life, in our time here under the sun, we are then to aim for joy. We are then to aim for pleasure and delight in the world around us. And so to do that, especially if for us, for me or for you, if that has not been the case, if you have not been doing a good job of that, then we need to figure out where to start. How do we do that? How do we implement that into our life? And I would suggest to you that going on some thrill-seeking sense of high adventure right off the bat is probably not the way to go if you have been struggling with that, right? I don't know that living a miserable, miserish life and then going straight to jump out of a plane, seeking some wild sense of joy would be wise. It may be too large of a paradigm shift. But when we start looking for joy, rather we should start with gratitude for the small things in life. Start with enjoying the daily gifts, as we've been told over and over again, that we have received. If you were to watch television and a commercial comes on, and especially if this was the 90s, early 2000s, what would you be told is the best part of waking up? That's it. Folgers in your cup. And let me suggest to you that there is 100% truth to that statement. There is nothing like it, and I don't mean to be negative about any sort of other coffee products. Actually, I had a fantastic cup of coffee, espresso, I don't even know how to describe it, something this afternoon, and it was fantastic. But as you know, I've been in the construction industry my whole life, and you may be surprised by the fact, but you walk onto a job site and into the job trailer, there is not an espresso machine in the corner. There's not even a Nespresso machine in the corner. There is usually an old school bun coffee burner and maker that you see at Waffle House. And I've been filling that thing with Folgers for decades. But the point is, I came across a story that I think gets the point across here with starting small. So I'd like to share that with you now. There was a gentleman who was a very acclaimed professor, and he worked most of his days from home in his study. And he had a, an assistant who did a whole host of things for him. But one of the things he did was bring him a cup of coffee every single day. And he would set it down on the desk beside the professor, and the professor usually was so deep in his work he would not even look up, but he would, without fail, say, I'm not worthy. And day after day, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. As soon as the aroma of those hot bean juice hit his nostrils. Well, one day, the assistant, who was a little irritated because he admired this gentleman, had great respect for this gentleman, that's why he was working for him, decided he had had enough and he was going to say something. So he sets the cup of coffee down. The professor, still staring at his work, says, I'm not worthy. The assistant says, sir, I'm sorry, but with all due respect, it's just a cup of coffee. I think you are. And still, without looking up, he shoes him away. And as he's leaving, he hears the professor mumbling something to himself. And one of the phrases that he hears is, he just doesn't get it. It's the thin end of the wedge. What he's pointing to is the simple blessings in life, the simple things in life. Enjoying those will then allow you to start to enjoy the things that are greater and greater and greater. If we're not grateful for the small things, if we're not grateful for the things that God does for us every day, then we start down a very 
slippery slope of not being grateful for the larger ones. Much like the character we discussed last time we were together from the show One Foot in the Grave, Victor Meldrew. So I would suggest that if we haven't yet started our journey into looking for joy, we must start it now. And if that means starting small, then so be it. Because the preacher's realism about old age and death is what brings on his command to rejoice and let your heart cheer you. It is made with an urgency due to the fact that it can only apply in the days of your youth. Ponce de Leon, I think that's who it was. I'm also not a huge history nerd, sorry. Never found that fountain he was looking for. So the days of our youth are going to go away. So I believe that we must ask ourselves, is our present being shaped by our future? Are we allowing the fact that one day we won't be able to enjoy the small things, to enjoy the things the same way that we do, and the fact that they've been given to us to enjoy in that finite time window? Are we allowing those things to be enjoyed and to take pleasure in them? That's it for this portion of finding joy and looking for pleasure in life. Is there any thoughts or questions on this before we move forward to the next? Yeah, Matt. Yeah, thank you very much. So Matt just got, Matt and a large portion of their family just got back from a cruise, and he mentioned that while everything there was fun and you go on excursions and do different things, that the fact, the part that he maybe enjoyed the most was actually getting back together and sitting down and discussing what had happened in life recently with them, right? So things that he could have done, as he said, whether he was on that cruise or not. And it highlights the small things that the relationships that you have, which they are a part of those small things that those things are what bring true joy. And without first enjoying those things, the greater things in life, the grander or larger things, I should say, lose their appeal. Anything else? Thank you, Matt. All right, let's move on. Let's read the text another time together, and then we're going to move on to the second thing that we see here in these verses. Light is sweet. And it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. For youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Let's stop there for now. We'll come back and read the rest of that in a little bit. So the next thing that we're looking at is this call to remember Him, to remember your Creator. Take a look again with me at the first verse of chapter 12. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. I'd like to ask you a question. Can somebody tell me why you think here in this passage God is referred to as your creator rather than the name God or something else?
Yeah, Joe, I think that's exactly it. Um, I don't believe that his using the term creator here is just him randomly pulling a descriptor of God out of a hat and sticking it in the verse. I think the preacher wants those of us in his audience who are still young enough, still relatively youthful, to take in his words while, re- was that me? while realizing that the doctrine of creation, when listened to, will point us to a life well lived. I think that the creation around us will speak truths to us about God and about ourselves that can dramatically change how we live in this world. The doctrine of creation, in my mind, brings to light the sentiment in Genesis 1, verse 31. If you want to turn there quickly, and I'm not going to insult you like Jonathan did this morning. I know you all know where Genesis is. Nobody needs to tell you that. But Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 says, This is right after the sixth day. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. To remember your creator is to remember and realize that he, in fact, made a good world, not an evil one. And that the ruin that has come to the creation is at the hands of mankind, not at the hands of the creator himself. In our lives, it looks like this. Taking our rightful spot in the appropriate manner and not demanding more for myself than it is my right to have. Jacques Elfel said it like this. You may consider yourself autonomous, but you are incapable of knowing what should be done incapable of knowing what wisdom is. You're a creature. Our problems do not stem from our failure to stay in the garden. All the evils, and I choose my words carefully, all the evils of the world stem from our taking ourselves to be the creator. I think what he's saying there is, or at least if I would have any discrepancy there, when we're talking about when we take ourselves to be able to do things outside of what God has designed us to do. So whether to take control or to seek gain outside of the gift and things of that nature. So remembering our creator in our youth helps us avoid that outcome, right? If we can think back to creation, let God's creation, the good and pure creation that God has given us, if we can remember that in our youth, then we can carry that with us through the remainder of our life to help let us guide the decisions that we make. Next, I want to look at this idea in the text of avoiding anxiety. If you look at the verse just before the beginning of chapter 12, the 10th verse of chapter 11, we are told to remove vexation from our heart. In essence, so we can pursue happiness and joy of the correct nature. As we looked at previously, if grumpiness flourishes with the sin of ingratitude, then I would suggest it's possible that anxiety flourishes with the sin of idolatry or the sin of trying to take control of more than we are trying to put ourselves, whether consciously or unconsciously, on the same level as God. Stemming from the belief that I am in charge of my life and must do all that I can to control it. I believe here that we see that anxiety about this life, and please understand I'm not speaking about any sort of clinical medical condition, but just the day-to-day anxiety of life that can be consuming to all of us at times, is the fool's response to the hevel in this world, particularly its fleeting nature. Jeffrey Myers said that the fool has not rightly discerned his own vaporous existence He is frustrated because he cannot manipulate existence to serve himself. I believe in that statement. Mr. Myers sums up perfectly the existence of the person who fancies themselves as the creator, or at least the controller discovering that they are, in fact, merely a creature. They are a piece of this creation that we are part of without the ability to control it. And again, as we've done so often throughout our time together this quarter, We can see the words of Jesus go hand in hand with the words of the preacher here in Ecclesiastes. We're not going to put it on the screen. 
because of the amount of text it is, but if you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to begin in verse 25. And when you get there, you may even see that the header in your Bible, if it's like mine, the header is, do not be anxious. Starting in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What will you eat or what will you drink? Nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here in the words of Jesus, and where we've been looking in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think we also see here Jesus reminding us plainly that we are creatures and that God is the creator who provides for our needs. And he's reminding us so much so by highlighting all the other parts of creation that he tells us, are we not greater than these? And if God will provide for them, surely he will do the same for us just like the preacher in Ecclesiastes is telling us, we can remove that vexation from our life. We need not worry. Just as everything else he has given us is good and fitting, these needs will be met. Any other thoughts or questions along those lines before we continue? Yeah, Clay. We're getting there, but not yet. So feel free. Yeah, right, so continue on, and actually, sorry, I thought you were talking about chapter 12, verse 6, but verse 11, verse 6, which we, yes, we did talk about it, but you're right, right? The idea there is to continue on. Don't just do the one thing, and don't worry about whether it's perfect or not. So in the morning, so in the evening, because you don't know which one is going to prosper. Thank you. So then we move on to this idea of doing these things while the time is right. In the text, we've seen a clear emphasis on the scene of creation, and we've talked about what that means in a few capacities, but I think there's another facet here to the purpose that it is serving. I believe that the call to remember our Creator while we are young is a commandment to recall how the world was meant to be and to seek to live in the light of that world so when the reality of the world and how it is now shows itself, we won't be swept off into old age without realizing the good of the world that we have been given. The fall of mankind has not removed all of the goodness and beauty from the creation. And if we allow ourselves to fall into that mindset, if we only see the negative, not the good, then we have not obeyed the words of the preacher. We have not remembered our creator. Look at me with at the beginning of verse 1, verse 2, and verse 6, if you will. I want to highlight the use of the word before here. So verse 1 says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. Verse 2, it says, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. And then again in verse 6, it says, before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. The word before here, I believe, is playing a significant role in relaying the message that the text wants us to receive. In each of these instances, we see a picture that reminds us once again that death is in store for all of us. And that being the case, we must remember who God is, who we are, and how we should live before the curtain of life is finally drawn. And God 
takes back the gift that he has given us. Then the imagery that we're moving to next kind of presents this idea of being unmade. It is interesting that here with all of this creation imagery, especially in verse 2 of chapter 12, that there seems to be a lot pointing to things being unmade, or as the text says, darkened and returned. And the same here as we have described for us, the unmaking of ourselves in this world through the process of aging. Kidner, in his book about Ecclesiastes, said this in regards to verse 2. All this will come in a stage when there is no longer resilience of youth or the prospect of... Let's move that out, see how that does. All this will come when there is no longer resilience of youth or the prospect of recovery to offset it. In one's early years and the greater part of life, troubles and illnesses are chiefly setbacks, not disasters. One expects the sky to clear eventually. It is hard to adjust to the closing of that long chapter, to know that now, in the final stretch, there will be no improvement. The clouds will always gather again. Time will no longer heal, but kill. And I think that that is a very good take on verse 2, which leads us into this interesting set of metaphors in verses 3 through 8 of chapter 12, where we're kind of have our bodies described piece by piece as this aging process is going to take place. Here the verbiage of the passage shifts from a meteorological type tone, speaking of things in the heavens, and shifts to that of a building or a home. And in doing so, and moving on from the happenings in the natural world to the state of disrepair a home has fallen into. And the words of the preacher here use the dilapidation process of a wonderful home to show what will happen to our bodies as we age. It's a very powerful set of metaphors and sayings to really help drive home his point. I want to back up quickly so we can read this text one more time. We're going to start here in verse 3. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors on the streets are shut when the sound of the grinding is low and the one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of the song are brought low. They are afraid of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desires fell because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the will broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. I love this section of text. I love the metaphors that it uses. And I can't read it without thinking about my grandmother on my father's side. When I was a kid, she loved to cook, have everyone over and serve at least once a week, usually on Sunday if calendars allowed, but at least once a week, and we went over there constantly. And when I was a little child, she would either have her coffee or her glass of tea. And when I was young, it was just kind of like this, right? And I thought she was just always stirring her ice. I didn't know any better. Anyway, as time progressed, and I became a teenager and could drive, that it turned into that. And that is not an exaggeration. It was like that all the time. I have no idea how she didn't just always have to have a mop out. But I remember going to her house one day. I was about 17 or 18. I drove to her house, and at her house, she had a front door, and you had a side door, and the side door went into the kitchen. And we always entered through the side door, because for whatever reason, I still don't know why, my grandparents, when no one was there, they both seemed to get the most relaxation just by sitting at the table in the kitchen. It doesn't make any sense to me. They didn't have comfortable chairs. It wasn't a huge kitchen. They weren't eating, but that's where they sat. And I walked in, and I called her Nanny. And I said, hey, Nanny. She said, hey, Ryan, can you get me some more coffee? And I looked, and she was using two hands to hand me her mug. And I said, sure, how is it today? And she said, well, I don't know. I spilled most of it. 
But that's what's being pointed to here. Things like that are going to happen to us. Look again at some of the terms used, right? The keepers of the house, which now tremble, I believe, are your hands, as I expressed there with my grandmother. At one time they were strong and capable of many things, defending and providing for yourself. The strong men, now stooping, I believe, are your legs, unable to support you how they have in years past, no longer swift and nimble, but stiff and bent. They can barely, if at all, bear your own weight. The grinders that cease and are few are your teeth. The windows that shut are our eyes. The doors that shut are our ears. And they all start to fail. It is only a matter of time. The evil days that we saw mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 12, when they arrive, these are the things that they take away with them. Christopher Hitchens wrote a piece for Vanity Fair magazine before his death. He had a form of cancer that removed his ability to speak, and he wrote a very poignant statement on what losing that ability was like. In that piece of work, he mentions the link between speaking and writing. And he says, think of how writers are often told to find their voice. And he said that to lose his ability to speak was to be deprived of an entire range of faculty it is surely to die more than just a little. I think that's the picture that we're being given here. Not just that these things in and of themselves individually are sad and terrible, which they are, but rather that they represent a sad and hard degeneration and decline of the body from what was previously. Seems that in the brave struggle to survive, there's almost a more pointed reminder of decay through this process than if you just meet total ruin all at once. As we see in verse 5, old age also brings upon fickle sleeping and early rising, a fear of falling to the ground of the unknown and venturing outdoors. It's hard to go around when you get to that point, right? I think of my youngest daughter, Sloane. She is a human wrecking ball. Not on purpose all the time. Sometimes it is on purpose, but not all the time. But she will run this way and look this way while she's doing it. And she hits the wall or a door jam or a chair, whatever it may be, and she falls and she gets a bruise or a bump and she has tears. But in a very short amount of time, that bump or that bruise returns back to just a normal piece of flesh. Those tears give way to a smile and happiness almost instantaneously. It can usually be laughed off. If not immediately, it won't take long. However, that same bump or bruise, that same fall as we're seeing here, for the older among us, at times can be disastrous. The almond tree blossoms, as it says, pointing to the fact that our hair becomes white. Another thing that I don't have to worry about. But the rest of you may be so. The one who used to run and skip now shuffles along. The abilities are diminished all across our body. There isn't much appetite for anything because with failing ability comes failing desire. I've read, we do not live, die wholly at our deaths. Rather, that's just the culmination of the process. But however, we know that it does culminate in death, and that's what's been being pointed to throughout this book over and over and over again. And if you look at verse 6, sorry Clay, this is the verse I thought we were going to earlier, it points to that very fact. And it's got four little metaphors there stating that, yes, things come to an end. And the fact is that that's going to happen. One day, as this imagery suggests, we will be undone. God's curse of creation in response to the fall of Eden means that time will see each of us unmade. And it could happen without the assistance of old age. We all know that. But either way, it will. So the, I think the preacher here is asking us, before that day arrives, how then will you live? How will you live, how will you remember your Creator in your youth so that when these evil days come, that you continue down the correct path, that you live a life of joy? And I believe that the answer that we should strive for is something similar to this. We should strive for a life that is full of pleasure, joy, and proper perspective. 
one that knows the proper time and place for the things of this life, and one that shows the world around us those very things. A life that depicts serving a higher purpose, a purpose larger than myself. One that recognizes gifts from our God, our place in the creation, and allows our mortality to spur us towards all of those things. And when the end nears, when things start to decline, although they will be hard, they can be celebrated because they are markers lighting the path home, telling us that we are drawing nearer, that we will have been living with these days in mind from our youth. Through a life of enjoyment and pleasure that is now reaching its end. I think that's what the point here that we're having driven home to us is. I think that's what the preacher would have us to do. When we're together next time, that will be our final class together, and we're going to look at the conclusion of chapter 12 and then go back and talk about some other things throughout the book itself. And that's going to be chapter 12, verse 9, through chapter 12, verse 14. Thank you for being here. We'll see you Wednesday night.
Good evening. Hope everyone's classes went well tonight. We'll sing two songs before we're dismissed. The first will be Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom. Sing all three verses. And we'll keep the tempo up. Oh, are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, right? good to be together tonight. I certainly enjoyed my class. I hope that you enjoyed your class and benefited greatly from your study in God's Word. I pray that as we continue this week, we'll be touched by what we read, by what we studied, and we'll be changed in light of it. I have a few announcements. I'm, uh, I don't have any additional announcements to what we mentioned this morning, but let me reiterate what we said this morning just so that you're aware of it or if you missed it. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please pray for the family of Joan Neal. Uh, she was a wonderful godly lady who passed away, great member of this church. Uh, that's Her services are going to be at the Garden of Memories. There's going to be a viewing on Tuesday, the 24th, from 6 to 8 p.m., and her funeral will be on the 25th uh, at 11 a.m. Also, I want to make sure that you're aware that uh, the college study is starting back up. That's going to be at the Keenan's house tomorrow night. Ladies' class is getting going again, so make sure you're here for that on Thursday. And I do want to make sure uh, that you know Don's not here today. That's why you're getting so many doses of me with the announcements in the sermon. He's, uh, he's preaching in Texas, but hopefully he'll be back home tomorrow. We'll look forward to having him back. Those are all the announcements I have. Uh, if you'll be standing, we'll have a song, we'll have a prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you so much for being here. Look into thee. We'll sing the first and the second verse, and then we'll sing the chorus once at the end. We'll just do two verses, and then...
Lord, we come to you at the close of this day. Father, we start every week reflecting on the fact that our sins killed the Son of God, and it breaks our heart to know that. However, we also rejoice because we know it was all part of your plan. Lord, we thank you for the Bible classes that we were a part of tonight and for the good teachers we have in this church. Lord, we also thank you for the leadership of this church family and for the stand for truth that is taken, especially in these times. Fathers, we start this week, help us to consider those things. Help us to consider those who are less fortunate than us, those who don't have a church family like the one here. Help us to show them what that's like. Help us to show them your way works through our words and our actions. We come to you through Jesus. Amen.